Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Day After Election Day expert panel. I'm Deandra Rose, an assistant professor of public policy and political science here at the Sanford School of Policy and director of research for Policy the Center for Politics. And like many of you, I have been glued to election returns. So I'm especially excited to have the opportunity to understand what on earth has been happening and what we can expect down coming down the line from this all-star panel of Duke experts. So welcome to today's event. We're live on Zoom and we have over 500 people who registered to be with us this afternoon. We're also sharing this conversation with the Sanford School of Public Policy's Policy 360 podcast. So welcome to those listeners as well. As I tell you a little bit about the Sanford School, I wanna ask your experience casting a ballot. So we're opening up a poll right now and we hope that you'll take just a few seconds to fill it out and we'll come back to those results in just a little while. The Sanford School's mission is to improve the lives and communities around us by researching the most pressing public policy issues and preparing students for lives of leadership, civic engagement and public service. Our two-year master's, our two-year professional master of public policy program offers students outstanding prep preparation for dynamic careers as analysts, leaders and managers at various levels of government, nonprofits, and corporations, domestically and internationally. We have over 100 MPP students who are with us at this event today. So welcome to all of our MPPs in the house. We know that they're going to ask some amazing questions. So we look forward to those questions. And to everyone, please do feel free to be thinking about the questions that you want answers to and place them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom platform at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those questions later in the program. But to kick things off, I am delighted to introduce our moderator and our panelists for today. So moderating today's event, we have Professor Mac McCorkle, who is Professor of the Practice and the Director of Policy Center for Politics here at Sanford's Pol Sanford Schools. Uh, the Sanford School of Public Policy. Mac has served as an issues consultant for political candidates, state governments, and various organizations for the last two decades. Since starting McCorkle Policy Consulting in 1994, he's worked for state and federal candidates in North Carolina and 28 other states. Mac's work has been featured in numerous academic journals and magazines. He's a graduate of Princeton University and Duke Law School, and he clerked on the US Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And for a number of years, he practiced law in Raleigh with a firm founded by former Duke University President Terry Sanford. Also very delighted to introduce Professor John Aldrich, who is with us today. Professor Aldrich is the Pfizer Pratt University Professor of Political Science, specializing in American politics and behavior, formal theory, and methodology. He's the author of numerous influential books and scholarly articles. Professor Aldrich is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he has served as president of the Southern Political Science Association, the Midwest Political Science Association, and the American Political Science Association. So welcome, John. Thanks for being with us. I'm delighted to, to present to you uh, Professor Guy Charles from the Duke University Law School. Professor Charles is the co-director of the Duke Law Center on Law, Race, and Politics. He's an expert in and frequent public commentator on constitutional law, election law, campaign finance, redistricting, politics, and race. Professor, Professor Charles is a past member of the National Research Commission on Elections and Voting and the Century Foundation Working Group on Election Reform. So welcome, Professor Charles. Excited to, to introduce to you, Professor Judith Kelly and Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. Professor Kelly is a political scientist and she's an expert in international relations. Professor Kelly's work focuses on how states, international organizations and NGOs can promote domestic political reforms in problem states and how international norms, laws and other governance tools influence state behavior. Welcome Dean Kelly. And finally, I'm excited to introduce Professor Bill Adair who is the Knight Professor of the Practice of Journalism and Public Policy and the Director of the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy. 
Professor Adair is a leader in fact checking and digital media, and his research and teaching focus on fact checking and accountability in journalism. In 2007, he launched the Pulitzer Prize winning website, PolitiFact. So welcome, Professor Adair. All right, over to you, Mac. Thank you, Deandra. Thank you. And thank you for everybody attending. I hope this will be a great session. Let me start off with Professor John Aldridge. Uh, whenever Professor Aldridge talks about politics, I'm smart enough at least to listen. And I know it was taken by a comment that he made recently that Donald Trump was the outsider in 2016, but when he was going to be running in 2020, he was is the insider, the incumbent. John, is that a, a good way of explaining what, of, of recapping what's been going on in, in the election process? Uh, thank you. And first, before starting, I want to thank you uh, for in, inviting me and including me in, and I want to welcome everybody uh, to this event. Uh, first thing to say is maybe you shouldn't look so, listen quite so closely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, what I would say is uh, that this election is uh, one of the most exciting events about which very little has changed. Um, uh, the, the, the first remarkable feature is how close the contests have been state by state in the presidential level and, and so forth to what was happened in 2016. Uh, even the states that flip one way or the other have generally been uh, states that have been very close and were very close in 2016. And so it's only a small number of net votes uh, changing this, tipping them to, to the other side. Uh, uh, the surprises are, are states that apparently uh, have become competitive, but not, not winnable. Uh, so that's what that suggests is that uh, in, with respect to, to Donald Trump, that his status as insider or outsider is uh, not especially relevant for uh, how, stretching how people think about this and how they chose. Um, uh, it, seems, it, it seems at first blush at least that they chose on very similar grounds. The second thing I wanted to comment about, which is related to this, um, uh, is that um, uh, one of the standard political science uh, uh, assertions has been that large turnouts advantage Democrats. It's not so obvious that that's the case this time. And uh, this is relevant, related to the first point in that it, in spite of the high degree of similarity, there is also changes that are happening to the political coalitions. So, um, so first, uh, it, uh, the advantage of uh, Democrats and high turnout is being, uh, made somewhat less consequential because the Republican Party coalition has been picking up uh, uh, less actively engaged partisans, um, the, the rural, the relatively less well off uh, and so forth among the whites. Um, and, and in effect, the sort of matching uh, the Democrats coalition that has a lot of people who are relatively uh, unlikely to turn out among, uh, among us. And so that high turnout, low turnout, it doesn't seem to be changing uh, to help one party or, or another. So, uh, so one message of this is that 2016, 2020 are, 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 are remarkably similar. Um, yet there is, you know, yet there are some certain clear differences. And I think that the, the thing that I would point to is that um, Joe Biden does not generate the same level of hostility among opposition that Hillary Clinton uh, did in 2016. Um, um, that, uh, that, and, and, and as a result, uh, he's able to make up just those little bit of edges and just the places where uh, Clinton's support waned uh, and led to the, the lack, loss, sorry, of the blue wall that seems to be coming back, at least in part with Wisconsin now apparently being part of it, maybe Michigan uh, being a part of his electoral coalition. Mm -hmm. well, well, let me defend you, uh, John. <laughs> uh, uh, what, what about, uh, isn't it important that Trump was the incumbent this time then, just implicitly in what you're saying, not the outsider? So um, yes and no. I mean, he still, he still calls to the outsiders. 
mm-hmm. um, and, and has an appeal to them in spite of the fact of being, you know, the, 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 uh, the ultimate insider of all insiders, um, he can still speak to them. And that's a, a unique talent uh, of his um, that, that has shaped, greatly shaped the, the continuity. I think you're right, uh, it greatly shaped the continuity of this contest. Thank you, John. So, Guy, John saying that the politics of 2020 is very similar to the politics of, of 2016, but we do have this specter of major legal controversy that, uh, that people have been expecting, fearing, and maybe is materializing in front of our very eyes. Should we expect a replay of the election, the post election of 2000, and arguments about hanging chads everywhere? Luckily, there are no chads. We have banished them from the Republic, so that helps. Um, so a couple of things that are worth thinking about. One of the fact issues is that um, the pandemic has probably helped with respect to litigation, because as a consequence of the pandemic, um, there were over 400 cases that were filed. And a lot of them were filed by Democrats and they were intended to make voting a lot easier. A number of states also changed their rules voluntarily to make voting easier. So in some respects, some of the issues that we would have had or could have um, that would have affected this election were more than likely resolved so much earlier through the process of litigation. And what you're seeing, and when you look at what happened yesterday, record turnout um, in the middle of a pandemic with very, very few issues with respect to voting. Of course, there are people who waited in line, Um, long lines and one might say, look, that shouldn't happen in an advanced democracy. But given the context under which we're operating, um, the expectation might have been that we would have a significantly greater set of questions and problems, violations, et cetera. So what that means is that in the post-election process, there's very little to litigate. Right. In order to litigate something, what you're trying, you're litigating a violation of the law. You're litigating a rule, a procedure, a process, something that went wrong that the law says you are entitled to. Well, when there's nothing much other than just waiting for normal processes, like waiting for the votes to count, waiting for the ballots to to be turned in, um, right? When there are very few issues to to litigate, especially because so many of those issues were litigated before the election, um, then the post-election process is going to, the the landscape for the post-election process is going to be relatively barren of litigation. So there's got to be, there has to be a problem. There's to be a legal question. There's got to be some procedure that mm-hmm. a state didn't follow or some violation of constitutional law. Um, and it's going to be hard, I think, to find it in this particular part of the process. There are a couple issues that are hanging um, out out there that may be relevant, depending upon how the politics turn out. Um, but not the types of questions and problems that we saw, say, as a consequence of Florida 2000, when you had ballots that, that people had to interpret and figure out, is this a legal vote or is it not a legal vote, right, that then presents an opportunity for litigation and contestation. Mm-hmm. I see what you're saying. I mean, if, if the election goes a certain way and Pennsylvania and Wisconsin's procedures aren't in dispute, it, it's over without having to discuss that. But is... Trump, the Trump lawyers have just said they're they're uh, they're demanding a recount. In Wisconsin is that a predicate for legal action to find problems or irregularities that they could then take to court? Or well, you could think of the recount as part of a normal process. Um, almost every state provides a mechanism for a recount if you're within a certain margin. So some states provide for an automatic recount. Some states you have to petition uh, if you're in particular a, a certain margin. Um, some states uh, limited to certain people. In some states, it's just any vote uh, the the candidate can 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 request a recount. And states have procedures that 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 can be followed. Not in, including recounts, but also if there are irregularities in the process, um, you could file a contest or a protest. Um, so there are mechanisms. So the recount is sort of the low level mechanism 
um, that, and it's, you could think of it as a traditional part of the process, that it is not unusual, it is not um, an external step, it is basically saying we're within the margins um, and we would like to be sure. So please go ahead and count all the votes again and the, in the way that it's provided for by state law. Um, now, perhaps something might come out of that, right? Then, you know, and, and it might be either a stalling mechanism or it could be an information mechanism where you discover something um, in the process that you didn't know before. Um, that's not, that doesn't often happen. That would be very rare. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's possible. So perhaps it might lay the predicate for uh, the Trump campaign, but at the very least, they would wanna know what the true margins are, right? How far behind they are and where they will have to make up the votes and how they might make up the votes. And that might inform their legal strategy as well. Gotcha. Judith, what's the world thinking about our uh, uh, viewing our election process, especially this uh, peculiar thing we call the electoral college and people worried about adding up states rather than just adding up votes? Well, Mac, thank you for that question. I, I certainly am in a position to speak for the world at large. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not, uh, you know, but it's it's inter it's interesting as a starting point, you know, to note that um, Freedom House, which, which rates uh, the freedom in countries around the world and the state of democracy in the world, in its last report noted for the 14th year in a row, a retreat of democracy around the world. And so that's a context in which this election is happening from, from a global perspective. And certainly our, our allies and many of the mature democracies, I think, I would think the most, the most common reaction right now is, is probably head scratching, uh, partly because uh, as you mentioned, the electoral college for one thing is something that not a lot of other countries have copied. And so they're just, you know, many of them used to it, but still uh, it, it, it comes, it lies in the face of them every time this happens, but um, I would say that, um, you know, whereas in, in the past, the United States really has been a, a beacon of democracy and has invented, you know, this whole notion of election observation. Uh, and it's really been striking, I think for me as a scholar of international elections and, and election observation, but also for, for people in, in uh, more mature democracies, it's been striking to see how the playbook leading up to this election has resounded, has, has, has replayed so many of the themes that I have been reading for years in election observation reports about other countries to which we have been sending election observers, right? And so I think that one thing that, that does seem clear, like, right, right, like he says, many things went right yesterday and, and many things can still go right in terms of following our rules and processes and, and, and to stay peaceful, but, I think no matter who wins this election, uh, the, the loser in some way uh, is our democracy itself. It's certainly taking uh, a beating uh, in that many of the norms that uh, underlie what a democracy is have been tested uh, and even violated in, in the more recent times. And to speak to your point about the electoral college, I think, you know, Again, with the US having really been the model democracy and, and the, one of the earliest ones, what, what we're really seeing is that the United States created a set of rules around democracy a long, long time ago. And other countries have leapfrogged and have implemented systems that are much more representative of direct democracy and that have more impartial commissions that oversee the electoral system, et cetera, I could go on and on. And for the last uh, uh, election since the 2002, international observers have been commenting time after time again on some of these flaws uh, in the American system. And the electoral college obviously is one that gets uh, a, a fair bit of play. It's not something that other countries have chosen to copy by and large. I mean, there are countries like, you know, Kazakhstan and a couple of other places that have them, but advanced democracies don't really use these uh, in, 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 in less than a few instances where they, after a direct vote, didn't resolve the election. Maybe they have some other, uh, other systems to resort to. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very struck by your pointing out that the Carter Commission, uh, that the, the, the Carter Center has put together uh, a, 
uh, task force to go observe elections, our elections, which is yeah. It's, unprecedented. It's, it's, it's quite striking because the Carter Center really was one of the, the forebearers of international election observation and, and, and created many of the techniques such as the parallel vote tabulation uh, that were, were used in countries around the world to check on the official uh, tabulation. And uh, they have observed elections in, you know, in 38 or 39 countries around the world routinely and never ever uh, said that they were going to get involved in an American election. This time around, you know, they're not observing, well, they are in Georgia, but they're not observing sort of in the traditional way, but they are, uh, they have officially weighed in with information and, and other uh, activities that they're engaged in. And they, and they said that the reason they did this was because those telltale signs that they normally look to to decide whether or not they should be in a country we're playing out in yeah. the United States, right? Um, yeah. So. Amazing. Bill, always a favorite topic. Want to know how, the, how you feel like the media has been covering this election and worked last night, but let me add the addendum. Also talk to us about polling. What do you think about what's been going on with polling in this election? Well, thank goodness I don't have to defend pollsters today, Mac. Um, <laughs> I, uh, so as far as the media goes, it's always it's it's important to always distinguish what types of media organizations we're talking about. I think um, the the mainstream news organizations that um, for their national coverage this time, for their coverage of the Trump administration, its response to the pandemic, for the New York Times investigation of President Trump's finances, I think really distinguished themselves. I think that there was some tremendous journalism at the national level, I don't think anyone had any lack of facts about how the administration was responding and not responding at this critical moment in our nation's history. Um, where I think there's a huge gap, and we can't forget about all of the state and, um, and congressional races that, uh, that were decided last night, and, and that's where there was a huge gap. And this is where my students ran into this. My students who are covering this for our publication, the Ninth, the Ninth Street Journal, <clears throat> we, we found often we were covering congressional races. We were the only journalists covering it in many cases, or they or the, the local news organizations had maybe done one sort of quick overview. And so that's where there's a huge gap. And we can't forget about that. We get very focused on the presidency but these other races are really critical. And that is a huge yawning gap. And that's something we can't stop talking about here in the future. Um, the polling is something I know we'll be talking about uh, in, in coming weeks. Um, just got an email from our alum, Neil Newhouse, with, uh, with his first explanation of what happened. Uh, Neil, a, a loyal Duke alum, um, explaining some of the things that um, that help explain um, why there was this belief um, towards the end that there could be a blue wave. Neil, a Republican pollster um, who was, um, I think, uh, in this particular race, polling in North Carolina for the National Republicans Senatorial Campaign Committee. And, he, and uh, they did a, a poll that ended last night and found um, late deciders broke really heavily towards Trump, he said in this email, um, and, and also something that we had been hearing but had been a little skeptical of, that um, a large, uh, a surprisingly large share of Trump voters were shy um, and were not revealing to their friends that they were supporting Trump, and so their, their poll found that. Um, one other point I'll make on this, and this does reflect back on news organizations, I think the news organizations were way too caught up in poll coverage, in horse race coverage towards the end. I think we needed to, to keep the focus on holding power accountable. In my world, it's about fact checking, it's about checking what they're saying. And I think the there was just this mania for who's up, who's down. And as my colleague Mark Stencil says, um, we need to, when we cover polls, we need to talk about the lack of precision of those polls rather than emphasize the precision. So anyway, a mixed bag, I think, on, uh, on my colleagues in, in the news media. Yeah, the false precision of polling, yeah. 
Our, DeAndre, I'm going to go a quick round to everybody, uh, panelists, real quick, if they can be short, and then we'll pick up. Uh, DeAndre's got questions from, from the audience. Is that right? Is John first? John, just picking up on, on what, what Bill said, in North Carolina, this was a source of frustration for many. Uh, are we ever going to see the emergence of a new Democratic majority? Is, is that just going to be talked about every cycle and then not really uh, come about? Or is it coming about? Uh, it, maybe awkwardly so. But one, of the, one of the signature moments of my thinking about the election was when the Gallup poll released its version of uh, the distribution of partisans uh, in October, uh, uh, in, in our October polling, and it was 31% Democrats, 31% Republicans, 39% Independents, and so and so on. Uh, and that may be the first election that they polled since 1936, in which the Republicans were anywhere near as a, that high as a tie. Uh, so clearly, we missed something. Um, there was something going on out there, and it's not obvious. Uh, we can we can see demographic trends that, that are going to favor um, uh, a Democratic side. We don't see the demographic trends or whatever it might be that builds on the Republican side, um, and that's I think where um, where both scholars and journalists need to spend their attention for understanding the direct future of American politics. Gotcha. Guy, I know people are going to want to hear your view just on the court uh, in, in general uh, with uh, the ascension of uh, Justice Barrett. Are you thinking that there's not going to, you don't really see a scenario where all the, the Trump appointees will get to rule or recuse themselves this time? So, Mac, there is a case, a Pennsylvania absentee ballot case that is already on the court's docket. Um, if it happens, like if the election comes down, let's say you know, the facts change a little bit and it really comes down to Pennsylvania or maybe even Pennsylvania and North Carolina, but comes down to Pennsylvania, it is possible that the court will hear that case um, and that it will be decisive. Uh, and basically that case offers up a um, legal argument that would be congenial to the conservatives on that court. There are easily three justices who, who would support that, or three conservative justices who would support that argument. And probably if you were uh, to force me to, to, to decide now, I would say probably five conservative justices who uh, would decide that argument and would likely rule in a way that would favor uh, the president because of the combination of the mm. argument and the outcome. Um, but, the, but given where we are today in terms of um, the states that are in play, the fact that the president is behind in a number of them and that um, it, Pennsylvania may not even be determinative, um, then the probability that the election mm -hmm. dispute will be resolved by the Supreme Court is extremely low. Now, you know, um, I started my academic career in 2000, um, so I will never say never. That was Bush v. Gore, and every single day we kind of watched the what we thought we knew one day, we knew it less the next day. So we kind of watched the train slowly walk up um, to uh, to the cliff. So I, I won't say never. Um, but at this stage, at this point, given what we know, given what the politics are, it looks very unlikely. Gotcha. And, and you did, I know you and I, you were talking about Electoral College and it may be blue sky to talk about getting rid of the Electoral College, but this problem's not going away. We, Democrats are going to keep on, it seems like they're could continue, however this election turns out, will probably... Biden will win a pretty comfortable popular uh, vote majority. And this will be not unprecedented. In fact, uh, it's happened a number of recent times. Is, are there anything, is there anything to do? Is there anything um, that is doable uh, uh, to address this? Or are we gonna have a situation where we really could have minority rule if, if we don't watch out? Um, I, I, I think it is a very, very difficult Thing to change, but I think there are things in the system that can be changed and can be addressed. You know, uh, I mean, I, I see that there's a question about campaign finance uh, 
And, um, you know, that's one of the things international election observers have commented on right now, the Federal Election Commission that's tasked with enforcing and reporting disclosure requirements doesn't even have a quorum and can't meet to oversee that. So, you know, we're not even talking about having the right laws in place. We're just talking about even implementing what we have and making that functioning. Uh, and then, uh, you know, other things that international observers have commented on are, uh, you know, the rights of felons to vote, for example, or, you know, we have issues with, uh, uh, you know, with the gerrymandering and on and on. I mean, there are lots of things we could do, smaller things as well, like it shouldn't be the case. And this is, this is exactly why we open ourselves up to all this litigation, is that it is the case right now that, that everything is so non-standardized, right? And it's, it's, it's in, in some ways a strength of the American electoral system that it's so decentralized. That makes it very difficult to attack and you can't just sort of wholesale you know, claim that it was stolen, as he says, you have to sort of pin it down and law that was broken in a given state and challenge that, et cetera, et cetera. You know, but there are some, some uniformity one, one, one would be able to think about just in terms of how do we handle mail ballots? You know, should we not handle them the same way in all states? Shouldn't the period after it, it, they've been postmarked and they could be counted be, you know, the same in every state? Uh, you know, on and on, there are lots of little things. Right now, we are such a mishmash of rules and ways of doing things that, it, you know, it's, uh, it's mind boggling, actually. And, um, uh, you know, it's, um, um, you know, it, it's worth paying attention to some of those things. But at the end of the day, Mac, I'll say that uh, I don't think you can just regulate yourself out of the situation we're in. It's not just a matter of getting all the rules in place and the system right. And democracy ultimately, rests on a social contract between, between citizens and a set of shared rules and norms. You can't regulate and say, you know, the loser must give a concession speech. You can't force those things, right? There are certain things that we have to just rely on as being shared values. And, and, and those don't take a, uh, a super majority uh, to change in Congress, but they do take different kind of groundwork among the electorate themselves. And, and on the one positive note I really saw from yesterday was the huge turnout and, and the peaceful conduct of, of the vote. And so I think we, we have some foundation to build on. Good, good. Bill, let me, let's close this session, part of the session with, with you. I know the subject of civil discourse is a subject near and dear to your heart, comes out of your concern about the media. I guess we know what it unfortunately might be like if we're not in a post-Trump era. But if we're in a post-Trump era, at least his maybe meaning that he's not present, I'm sure he'll have a presence. Um, what could you see about the prospects for the nation coming together or journalists helping that? Or, or where would we, what institutions would we look to to kind of help heal uh, this, this divided country? Well, I think... Um... I, I wish I could be more optimistic about that, Mac, <laughs> um, because I, I'm not sure structurally, um, uh, even if, if Trump does lose, that, that the, the media infrastructure changes. You know, talk radio, and we forget about talk radio, is still a huge factor. Um, uh, Fox News is still a huge factor. I think the biggest thing that could change would be if um, if uh, Lachlan Murdoch were to uh, change the whole tone of Fox and were to get together with the leaders of Fox and, and reposition it as a, as a different kind of conservative news organization. Um, and I, I think that could change the tone. You've seen, it's been interesting to watch the change in the Drudge Report. And so, um, um, my colleague Jeff Jarvis at CUNY has often talked about a, a different kind of conservative news organization. So I think it would take something like that to sort of um, de-escalate the, the partisan wars. But we still have this problem of misinformation and, um, and that's gotta be dealt with too. DeAndre, it looks like we have a bunch of questions. Do you, do you wanna, do. let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Max. So before jumping into questions, I just want to return to those polls that people were kind enough to fill out at the top of the event. So the first question was, how did you vote? 48% of people with us today voted early in person, 24% mailed in a ballot, 17% 
drop their ballots off at the Board of Elections and 5% voted in person on election day. Second question, did you wait in line? Most people sailed right through, only four people <coughs> waited more than two hours. And then for the final question, did you have any, any problems when you cast your ballot? Of the 256 people who responded to that question who cast a ballot, only 10 had a problem. So um, fascinating data. Thank you all for taking the time to complete those polls. So the first question I will target to Bill, if I may. Um, so this question comes from Sharon Updike and Sharon asks, what will Project Lincoln dot org do now or um, so we know them I, I follow them on Twitter I know many people do Bill what's what's next for Project Lincoln that's gonna be really interesting we had one of their uh, one of their organizers uh, Stuart Stevens spoke to my advanced reporting class two weeks ago um, and and they really um, are an interesting um, factor um, I don't think they've they've been exactly clear what they what they plan to do they really could play a role in um, in trying to change the um, the the things that are talked about in the Republican Party, w one thing to remember though, their ads really um, didn't change the 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 tone of the campaign. They were awfully negative. I mean, these were some of the sharpest, most biting ads we saw. They went negative in many ways. So the Biden campaign could go positive, not that they were talking to each other, but um, so it will be really interesting to see. I don't know what they plan to do. I don't think they have announced yet. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, let's see, so uh, to go back to this, uh, there are a number of questions in the Q&A um, box related to polling. So John, if I could, could come back to you and just ask for some insight into, do you think we will change how we use polls after this election? Are polls just done? Um, where are we with polls? So, well, polls won't be done, but, um, but I think there'll be some, there's some potential for, for serious change. Um, one of them, uh, it, so the polling for getting likely voters was really complicated this year because um, you, know, you, have, you have all your, technology worked out for how you're going to measure them. And then, you know, 80% of the states changed their rules. Um, and uh, and it, changed, it changed people's behavior. Um, and so, you know, there, there's a little bit of leeway for understanding that, there were, that, that their current procedures were, uh, you know, were difficult to implement and, and, and hard to catch up with. Second thing is uh, that uh, I, I anticipate the, the, the shy Trump or whatever uh, problem being addressed by merging uh, of social media with, uh, with uh, the actual polling in some fashion. Uh, we're not, not there yet because, you know, but the technological change that could happen within four years might, and that might give you a pretty good hint that people who say, you know, I, I'm not going to vote or I'm going to you know, vote for the opposition or vote for a third party candidate, they're really hiding who they're, uh, who they're, they're voting for. So that would be, that would be uh, a way that I could see things changing. Uh, um, that, um, you know, I mean, basically, you know, one of the problems it, with 2020 was that they were uh, adapting to the world of 2016 um, and living up to Rumsfeld's, you know, dealing with the, the known unknowns. Um, and, and, and all of a sudden there were a bunch of unknown unknowns that, uh, that left them somewhat adrift. And so, and so like all good generals, they'll probably be polling for 2020 election in 2024. Thanks so much, John. So I'd like to, to start with Guy for this next question, if I may. So this question comes from Sarah Zubek and Sarah asks, you know, can you speak to the allegations of fraud in the vote tabulation now? Um, there are major accusations of fraud um, all through conservative media. And we've seen discussions of fraud, especially related to mail-in voting throughout the campaign. So Guy, do you have any insights for us on how we should be thinking about the idea or issue of fraud? Sure. So two questions, two uh, ways of thinking about it. The first is that the assumption is that um, mail-in ballots or absentee ballots or mail-in voting 
um, depending upon which category, how one thinks about them, uh, and which category one put, puts them in, is more susceptible to fraud. Uh, so the assumption is, look, you're not going to the poll, you're not showing up, um, and you're not, you don't have to say who you are, and, some, and especially in places where you don't have to provide, you have to provide an ID, right? So the assumption is somebody else could be filling out your ballot for you, um, and obviously, uh, and, and misrepresenting uh, who you are or for nefarious purposes. And so the, uh, our, the assumption is that that's much more susceptible to fraud uh, than, especially in, in states that as a result of the pandemic automatically sent ballots to, um, to their voters, to, the, to registered voters. Um, and one can imagine then that people may go around collecting those ballots uh, and, uh, and then um, misrepresent who the voter is in order to commit um, ele election and voter fraud. Um, so we don't have any, I don't have any evidence that I'm aware of that this happened and that this scenario that we're imagining happened in this election, either in the distribution, collection or counting of mail ballots. Um, now, if there are specific allegations, again, states have mechanisms for dealing with it. So for example, in North Carolina, uh, one can file a protest and to say, look, there's been a problem in the tabulation or there's been a problem in the way that we a, a, a vote something that is not a legitimate vote has been counted and one can bring the evidence. But I'm not aware of, the, I've heard the allegations and the rumors but I'm not aware of the specifics, so I can't speak to, and, and I'm not, and not in a position to verify whether that has happened or not, but I've seen no credible evidence um, that there's been manufactured um, ballots as a consequence of um, mail ballots being mailed to either non-voters or voters selling them or however, whatever we wanna imagine could have happened in those cases. Thank you so much, Gabe. So uh, Dean Kelly, next question for you. So this comes from Shannon Craven and Shannon asks G Dean Kelly, she says, you seem to suggest that the US should migrate to a popular vote. Doesn't the electoral college protect less populous and more rural states from being discounted and afforded less political power and attention than highly populated states like New York and California? I mean, I certainly we could get into a, a long a debate about um, the role of the Electoral College, of which I would not claim to be um, an expert. Uh, I merely point out how unusual it is uh, in mature democracies to use this particular form of indirect vote, uh, in that normally we think of democracy, uh, especially when it comes to national office, to mean uh, a, a popular direct, a direct vote. Um, I will just, if I, if I may just comment on, on the question of mail-in ballots that, that Guy was just talking about, because I think I think it's worth mentioning, you know, because we did have a case of mail of what's it's called mail harvesting, right? Mail ballot harvesting, uh, and that actually happened in 2018, right here in North Carolina. And I think what is what's worth mentioning about that is that we caught it. It was caught. It was investigated, and it was corrected. And and the reason these things get caught is because there are a set of expectations, roughly, about how the vote should pan out. Uh, and when that doesn't happen, a flag goes up and, and people will be investigating it. So, so I actually have a lot of confidence that, uh, not that things like that can't happen, but that we're good at catching them. And I think that should give us some consolation. Thank you so much, Judith. Uh, for the next question, I'd like to ask our moderator, um, Professor McCorkle, um, about North Carolina politics. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, if I may. Uh, this question comes from Monique Harris, and Monique says, I'm trying to understand, how is it that in North Carolina, Governor Cooper has been reelected, uh, yet President Trump seems positioned to carry the state? Do you think that this is Governor Cooper's, um, you know, winning due to perhaps K-12 educators appreciating how he handled the pandemic. And I would add that we're seeing also the Lieutenant Governor who was elected yesterday is a Republican. So North Carolinians are splitting those tickets all the way down the ballot. Yeah. Well, two things, I, 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 on the Lieutenant Governor, North Carolina has an African-American Lieutenant Governor, 
uh, a very conservative uh, African-American lieutenant governor. But when I was in politics, when I was deputy cam campaign manager of the Harvey Gantt campaign, the idea that you would have two African-Americans running for a position next to the governor in North Carolina would have caused waves. And it was just an, uh, an, uh, an asterisk uh, uh, last night. I don't know if that's all progress, but, but at least maybe we should celebrate that, 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 it, that maybe that it had no, uh, very little attention. Uh, what was the first question, Deandra? I think that just thinking about, um, you know, how do we make sense oh, Cooper, of- yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've, that, that's not the first time I've heard that, asked, had that today. And uh, John Aldridge may want to comment on this too. I think it proves, what North Carolina proves is all politics is national or mostly all politics is national, especially in North Carolina. So what you saw is within a range of one or two points, pretty consistently starting with Trump Biden, which is like one and a half points for Trump right now and might may shrink even a little bit more, very consistently throughout the back down ballot, you know, for uh, uh, races, little differences here and there, if you were an incumbent and people knew you, you might do better, but very similar throughout the whole uh, uh, ballot. And then Governor Cooper, I think stood out not for any ideological reason, but because of, of a non-ideological reason. I think a number of people who split their ticket, who otherwise voted Republican, thought he had done a very reasonable, calm, and good job as governor on, on the virus. So he was able to get outside that ideological vortex to a couple points. But people thought that Roy Cooper was going to win by double digits. He ended up winning by four or five. So it's not so much that people are making a reasoned decision about or trying to make a decision like, I'm going to vote for Trump and then I'll vote for Cooper. It's so many people are saying, I really dislike the Democrats, so I'm voting completely for the Republican ticket. And other people saying, I really can't stand the Republicans. And so I'm going to vote straight for the Democratic ticket. And Cooper is the exception. I was hoping that C Cooper, as a, as a Democrat in my spare time, uh, would have uh, caused some kind of uh, coattails for the rest of the Democratic ticket. In fact, he was the exception in almost every other race was way closer to the, uh, to the margins that the marginal, the marginal range that Biden and Trump set for the rest of the, the races. Thank you so much. And so let's see, for this next question, uh, maybe I'll start with John, if I may. And of course, if any other panelists want to weigh in, please feel free to, to jump in. Um, so John, this question comes from Stephen Resch. And Stephen asks, what could we expect to see in future elections based on how the younger groups voted in this election? So thinking about youth turnout. Yes. Um, so most of the studies of youth turnout have been about college, edu college bound or, or educated uh, youth, and we don't know very much yet about the what 65 percent who are are not engaged in college and how how they turned out. That's number one. Number two is um, uh, is that uh, it does seem that that there's a way of of organ. That one of the difficulties is very hard to organize the youngest people because they're not integrated into communities and so forth in the way that. Every, that older people are so it's hard to it's hard to really get a, a, a collective action going on to get them to, to turn out um, uh, and that's a problem that problem if you will that 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 is unlikely to be solved. There's always going to be a, a expectation of lower turnout. Um, the other thing that's going to happen is that their views are going to evolve. Uh, because their life circumstances will be changing in dramatic fashion. So what happens today with the youth is not what's going to happen with the, those same people four years from now, eight years from now, because they're going to be in very different circumstances in their life. So it's hard to draw lessons uh, other than universities uh, are a wonderful place for organizing young people, and it's difficult to find other such places. Um, used to be unions, right? You could go in, uh, you catch people beginning their career in, uh, in industrial jobs and, and they would be organized. It, it, that's much less the case today. And so it's just, uh, and so they're sort of falling into the bowling alone, Robert Putnam problem uh, of not being in a, embedded in organizations. 
Thank you so much, John. Um, so I'd like to pose this generally to anyone in the group, um, wondering about the incredible amount of money that is in this election. Um, Dean Kelly mentioned this question a little earlier in the segment. This comes from Susan Kaufman. Uh, Susan says, can, or asks, can anyone comment on this incredible and or obscene amount of money that was spent on this election? Must we citizens accept that, um, except this is something that we can't change, why can't we get spending limits as a country such as France has done? I'll take the, the law part of that question. So one reason why you can't get spending limits is because the court has ruled that expenditure limitations are a violation of the First Amendment. Um, contribution limitations are not, but to put spending limits on what a person can spend for their election or to elect somebody else is a violation um, of our fundamental rules of free speech. Um, and that um, ruling, I don't think is going to change anytime soon. Uh, so um, spending limitations by statute um, are, um, are going to be ruled unconstitutional. And so they don't present an option for limiting the role of money in politics. I like to think of it down to us. Yeah, we have one person, one vote, but we don't have one person, one voice. Um, and um, some people get to walk around with megaphones um, and, and somehow we think that, um, that that doesn't affect, you know, outcome, uh, which is yeah, obviously pretty naive given that people otherwise wouldn't spend so much money. So it's a bit circular, but we're unfortunately stuck in that. Thank you so much. Just, oh, one, John. Quick, just one quick comment on that. Uh, uh, in addition, um, uh, and getting back to the, the, the question, the question, the way it was framed is, a, is, is very good. I don't know whether it's obscene or not, but, it, but there were so much money in some of these cam campaigns, they couldn't quite figure out what to do with it. Um, so then you know you have enough money um, um, to, <laughs> when you're in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so this next question comes from Jessica Sullivan, and Jessica asks if our panelists can say a little bit about the attempts by the Trump campaign to stop vote counting in Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, what do you see as the next steps for those states? Happy to start here as well. Um, I just don't, in order to stop the vote counting, uh, there are two ways that you can do it. One is you could go to court and, and offer a legal basis. The other is you could try intimidation. So um, you, many of us will remember the Brooks Brothers riot from again, Florida 2000. Um, and so there's really no, there are no legal bases for stopping the vote counting. Um, it's just as a process that has to happen. Uh, and, and it will continue to happen until the votes are um, made official by the um, by this process that the state designates. Um, so I, I don't think that's uh, something that can be done legally. At least I haven't seen an argument um, for it. Um, as I said, the only um, argument that's hanging out there is the one on absentee ballots by made by the state um, courts that in North Carolina and Pennsylvania that uh, one can receive absentee ballots after the deadline set by the state. So that's that's a one legal argument, um, but that's specific to some states and not applicable in a lot of others. Mm -hmm. Guy, Guy, I was thinking that isn't, uh, I'll try to be the recovering lawyer here, but the other difference, Bush v. Gore, the Supreme Court stepped in to stop a recount. The Supreme Court didn't st step in to stop the counting, the, the first counting of votes. That's correct. And, and the court did that because um, the argument was that the state was applying. So there are two parts of the argument. One is that there was no uniform basis for the recount. Uh, so there were a standard that was being applied and, and some sets and a different standard for determining what was a vote. And there was no way of getting a uniform way. Right. So some people were looking at the hanging chads and saying, OK, if it hangs by one, that counts. 
and other people were saying no there had to be three things attached four things attached right the whole thing had to be detached uh, of course, there's no basis by which we could have a uniform and legitimate count so we had to stop it and that would take too long given that the state also wanted to take advantage of the safe harbor provision uh so yeah so you're right that that's very different there where the <laughs> arguably a legal basis for a recount um, that the court thought would damage the, uh, the person who was ahead already in, in the count after, after they had gone through the process. As opposed to here, the attempt is to just trying to stop the voting, the counting in the initial instance, um, right, of counting all the ballots. And so it's hard to figure out, well, what's the justification for that? And, and one other thing, Gigi, if I could ask you, just, just to the person who asked about the, the problem of money and speech. I agree with you completely that Buckley v. Vallejo stops cold any legislation, but people are have been banding together for a constitutional amendment, right? I mean, that, that would be the route if someone was interested, if the student was really interested. Certainly, you could do a constitutional amendment and we all know how hard that is, but you can, but, <clears throat> but you could also incentivize public financing. So that's the other option. And if people, people can voluntarily choose, now you can't ban everybody. That is, if I'm an, independent, if I'm an in independently wealthy or whatever, I wanna spend money in, in the election, um, I can. But with respect to candidates, you can certainly create a rule and we had it in the presidential system, uh, though um, we outgrew it because of the amount of money that the rise in spending and then just didn't keep up. But you can create a rule in which people vol volunteer to, um, to sell, to restrain if they take public financing. Could I just step in in a slightly different, Jessica, nice question. You're always asking hard questions. Um, the, politically, uh, the only, this is a, you know, getting enormous, I, literally the cent center of democracy, that, that not all votes count in a very literal sense of the term uh, if, if this were implemented. And it requires officials to simply stand up and say, you know, the, 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 this, this shall not happen. Um, and I think that's what happened in Michigan. I'm sure what happened in Pennsylvania exactly. Uh, I think they just sort of ignored it. Um, but in, in, in Michigan, they tried to do that. The, the other thing that should be happening is we should have a reasonable number of Republicans, a few, but not very many have stood up and said, you know, this, this should not happen um, and, it, and reinforce the norm. And so in some ways, if it were to work that way, it would strengthen the norm uh, by having the sort of strong enforcement under threat. Thank you so much. So Bill, I'm going to, if I may target um, or, or send this first, this next question to you, because I feel like the media will play a central role in what happens here. This comes from Lolita Stevenson. Lolita says, four years is a long time. And the civic lessons we've achieved over the last four years is remarkable. My question is, how do we hold on to the attention and vigor of the younger generation as we move through the next four years? That's a great question. Uh, I, I think um, uh, I, my sense is younger voters have definitely gotten more engaged. Um, I think a big part of that has been they've, they found a sort of common enemy that they, <laughs> that they wanted to vote against. And so how do you continue to tap that? Uh, how do you con continue to get that passion uh, and, and that's, I don't think that's as easy. Um, what, what needs to emerge is some sort of a charismatic leader, I think, um, and a movement that would, um, that would be the catalyst for that. I think the, the, the most promising thing is Black Lives Matter. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement has been marvelous in, um, just generating a lot of enthusiasm by, um, people of all races, and so I think I think that can do it. And I think um, it, it has shown so far that it's um, there are just a lot of things that are going well beyond what happened in the summer. So I, I think that shows some great promise. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, let's see, John, may I ask this next question of you? Um, this is going back to sort of campaign season and it comes from Ed Block. And Ed asks, how much do you think 
President Trump's last minute series of rallies affected Republican turnout? Um, it's, it's very hard to judge that for sure, of course, but uh, it, um, you know, it certainly fits with the, the idea that he did generate the, in, the enthusiasm. Was almost every place he went um, had uh, an a, a unusual Republican showing and or a depression of the Democratic turnout. Uh, that seems consistent with it. So it looks promising that his campaigning actually had uh, uh, effects. Now, of course, it's hard to say that uh, it, that he didn't go to places that that this is already happening and he was just accelerating it. Um, but but it really looks like uh, that that he did a really good job and picking out places where where his presence would actually make a difference. And John, if I might follow up with you on a second question, sort of in that same ballpark. Um, this comes from James Woldenberg, and he asks, how do we explain on a macro level the closeness of this presidential election, the GOP House pickup of seats, the holding of the GOP's Senate majority in the midst of a global pandemic, the historic unemployment and President Trump's consistently high negatives? What conclusions can political scientists draw um, as to this anomaly? Um, I'm tempted to, to mention a uh, book manuscript that Bailey Sanders, who may be listening or, or, or here, uh, and, and I are working on about the transition from about 1984 to today, uh, sort of uh, focusing down directly onto two things. One of them is going to 50-50, going to that is wherever there is a, a, a gap, the one party moves in to take, take that, the other party moves in a different way, and it's moving right down to an even division. The, the second thing is that it's a division that is extremely deep. Um, and uh, I think somebody, Mac or somebody was mentioning this before, uh, the, if you're on, on the Democratic side on one thing, you're on the, on the Democratic side on everything. Um, if you're in the Republican side for one candidate, you're on, you find out, even if you're trying to do it so independently, that they all seem, they're, they're all in the same vein and you're always gonna support them. Uh, that's not what used to be the case um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even into the 1980s, uh, where there was a lot of a lot of room for cutting across party lines. That's the, everything's lining up. Uh, we're having a single deep cleavage now between the two parties, um, and with the parties able to compete everywhere now that the Republican Party is fully competitive in the South, which it was just becoming in the 80s. Um, there's competition everywhere and they're looking for every advantage and you would expect it to converge to a 50-50, but 50-50 with a deep division. Deandra, if I can add a media perspective to that. Thank you. Um, and I think John's exactly right. And I think the, the, um, the media ecosystem makes that possible because people exist in two different worlds. You know, that, that um, the, there's just, two very different realities if you're watching conservative media um, that you're not seeing the same, um, you're not seeing the same topics being discussed. You're not seeing the same facts. Uh, if you're getting facts, it's just an, an entirely different world. And that's what's really troubling to me um, as someone who's been a fact checker for so long to just see this alternative reality that um, people are existing in and, and that's gonna make it so hard for, you know, John was referring to the days of compromise and I remember that from covering Congress in the White House. And, you know, now there's so rarely a compromise because um, the parties exist in such different worlds. And that's largely because of the conservative media ecosystem. So Guy, if I might, um, I have a question from Stephen Kelly. And Stephen says, the US Post Office has been accused of failing to deliver upwards of 300,000 ballots on election day. Given that some states refuse to count ballots that arrive after election day, is there a legal case to be made that these ballots should still be counted? I, I don't think so. So there are actually two really interesting problems here. Um, the first is that the US Post Office was under a federal order to scour and to go through and to make sure that they've implemented procedures pursuant to the court order 
um, that um, they've looked for all ballots and and all of the post offices. Um, and apparently they said to the federal judge, which one never does, but they said to the federal judge, um, no, we actually can't do that. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an initial problem. Um, and then the second is what do you do um, when um, the states have rules um, that say that you can't count ballots if they haven't arrived, uh, but voters through no fault of their own have done everything that they can um, in order to vote and have done, tried to do it by law and the ballots maybe might get there you know, a week or two, et cetera, um, at, at the end. I think that presents a really thorny and difficult problem. Um, and it's not clear to me that there is an obvious remedy uh, that one can simply count the ballots in a way that is inconsistent with the laws of the state, even though um, that would, um, you know, the choice is harming the voter or undermining the rules, even though the voter is innocent uh, and did everything that, that they can. So that's, that's, a, that's a difficult question, but I'm not sure that there is a real remedy here. So if I might ask a, a North Carolina question, one more, Professor McCorkle. Um, there was a question that was submitted to, asking about the North Carolina state legislature and you know, just some insights you all might be able to give about that particular balance um, and, and you know, some surprising results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Democrats thought that they might have a shot at getting uh, taking control of one of the houses. They started off 29, down 29-21 in the Senate and 65-55 in the House. They only picked up one seat net in the Senate and lost three or four. Uh, they're now at 69-51, whatever that math is. Uh, so they did not, the Republicans do not have a super majority but it was a very disappointing uh, night for the uh, legislative Democrats. And it does present uh, a situation where the Republicans now will have a green light to do the um, redistricting without the governor's veto. So, uh, and the Republicans will be stronger. Uh, they'll have a, a, a Lieutenant Governor uh, to, add, to uh, replace the old Lieutenant, Republican Lieutenant Governor. So it was not a good night uh, for the legislative uh, Democrats in North, in North Carolina. And just again, reflected uh, this polarization that John's eloquently talked about, that these races were in many cases tight, but, but Democrats were, were losing. And Democrats lost some incumbents, which they were not expecting to do so. So if I might ask, I know we're starting to near the end of our time together, but I want to pose one question to our entire panel panel of experts. Um, it's a question from Jeffrey Krauss, and Jeffrey asks, is our democracy broken? Uh, and then I might tag on to that. What, you know, if there's room for, for hope, what gives you hope? Uh, I'll start with hope. Um, uh, my students yesterday covered uh, the election in Durham and went everywhere, talked to voters, talked to poll workers, um, uh, followed the director of the elections, um, watched the counting, and the democracy was not broken. Um, the democracy worked. It was great to see um, the, uh, at least when you look at it through the lens of elections administration, it was quite impressive. And so we, you know, had heard all this brouhaha about the election being a mess. In Durham, it was really well run and we were very impressed. Thank you so much, Bill. And if I might go to Guy next, because I know he may need to um, head to another meeting. Um, sure, thank you. Um, you know, I agree with a lot of what Bill has said. On, on the one hand, I mean, just think about the fact that uh, we, um, as, a, as a country in a decentralized environment in the middle of a pandemic, overlaid with structural or racial questions, um, deeply polarized society, uh, ran an election with record turnout, um, right? And yes, there were issues, but not anywhere near what we were expecting. So um, right, people cared, people showed up and the machinery worked, right? So, so that's 
that's that's very good news. Um, there are also lots of questions that we that we have to address. There, um, the way that we run elections in the United States is is you know there are lots of problems and deficiencies. We have to fix them. Uh, we have to address them. Uh, Dean Kelly mentioned some of those questions earlier. The issues that we have to deal with, um, the large um, major issues, climate change, um, structural inequality, economic inequality, right? So we have a lot of questions. Um, Bill and John were talking about people are operating in different ecosystems, that there's a lot of polarization. We need to figure out how to get come together in, in many ways, right? So um, so those are those questions are on the table. We've got to figure, figure them out. Right, and and I think that's those are the types of issues that makes us make a war makes us worry about the future of a polity that is supposed to bring a an increasingly diverse group of people together in a and in, in a major and large country, um, and we've got to sort that out. Thank you so much, Guy. Let's see, maybe next we'll go to um, to John. So uh, yes, I. I like to point out two, two different things. One of them is that if the if, if it is the case that Biden is, becomes gets 270 electoral votes and the Trump campaign chooses only to challenge within the rules of the game and they accept the outcome, that would be a, a, a sort of major reinforcement of the, the norms of democracy as we have implemented them within our electoral system um, and, and reinforcing the rules of law. So that's a good thing. The second thing is that we had a lot of people who cared a lot about this election as, as, as Dee was saying uh, and, and Bill um, and, and, and there seems to have been relatively little violence um, um, associated with it when there was the opportunity for it and there were talk about it. Uh, and, um, and, and if that stays through all the way through inaugura inauguration day, uh, I think that is another re slight reinforcement of the norms of democracy or not the failure of the norms uh, of democracy. And, that's, uh, and, and so those are, my, those are my little hope from the, a small town in Arkansas. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much, John. And Dean Kelly, final word on that. I don't know if you want me to be the final word, but you know, I'm, I'm, I like to bicycle as, as you know, and um, you get a puncture in your, in, your, in your tire and you put a patch on it and, and then you keep biking and then you hit another uh, shard of glass or something like that, you put another patch on and after a while your inner tube is pretty compromised and, and you really don't want to just be riding that bicycle over a lot of bumps because it, the, the patches are not gonna, are not gonna continue to hold up. And I do think that we've gotten a lot of punches in our democracy inner tube um, over the last couple of years as we've been, as, as we've been riding this, you know, um, things that we, we normally would not think was, uh, you know, conceivable in our democracy, such as, you know, hinting at delaying the election or hinting at staying in office be beyond the constitutionally allowed period or, you know, uh, attacking the media or sowing misinformation and on and on and on. And so I, I do agree very much with, um, with my colleagues. Much will depend on what happens uh, over the next uh, two or three weeks. And it really is not just about Trump. It really is about uh, the elected officials uh, in the Republican and the Democratic Party choosing uh, to stand up for democratic values, choosing to call the game when the game is over and to respect the process. And uh, that'll be such an important first step to um, uh, getting to a, at least a station where we can, uh, where we can uh, put on uh, maybe a new inner tube at some point. Thank you so much, Dean Kelly. And um, just to, to, to thank our entire panel, uh, Dean Yudit Kelly, Professor John Aldrich, Professor Bill Adair, Professor Guy Charles, our wonderful moderator, Professor Mac McCorkle. Uh, thank you all for being with us tonight. And um, I have to say, this is an iterative conversation. So it will continue to unfold um, here at Stanford, here at Duke University um, and in our community. So we hope you will, will stick with us for more conversations uh, to come. Um, and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to those who are listening on Sanford's Policy 360 podcast. I'm Deandra Rose, and we're wishing you a great day after the election day. <laughs>